All right, well, we will go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It's entitled R Rising Waters in Northern Michigan, a webinar for shoreline property owners. My name is Jennifer McKay, and I'm the policy director at Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. I will be your host for today's webinar and one of today's speakers. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Watershed Council, we are a nonprofit membership-based organization with 40 years of history protecting and improving water resources in northern Michigan. We protect, restore, and enhance our lakes, streams, wetlands, and groundwater through respected advocacy, innovative ed education, technically sound water quality monitoring, thorough research and restoration, actions and we achieve our mission by empowering others and we believe in the capacity to make a positive difference so we work locally regionally and throughout the great lakes basin to achieve our goals we were formed in 1979 by a coalition of lake associations and researchers at the university of michigan biostation who pooled their resources together to create an organization that would be the voice of water resources in northern michigan we currently have 13 staff members hundreds of volunteers that work tirelessly to achieve our mission. Today's webinar is made possible by the generous funding from the Charlevoix County Community Foundation and the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation. A bit of housekeeping before we begin, all attendees will be muted throughout the webinar to avoid background noise. And throughout the webinar, you can ask a question by typing your question into the Q&A box. Please note that we have completely maxed out participation with 300 attendees. So we will do our best to answer all the questions, uh, but given time limitations, we may not be able to. Uh, in addition, I did wanna mention that we are recording today's webinar and it will be made available on the Watershed Council's website and our YouTube channel uh, next week. We have a great lineup for today's webinar. We have uh, Deanna Apps. Deanna has worked for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Detroit district for about four years. The lead forecaster for the Great Lakes water levels. She received her bachelor's of science degree in meteorology from um, SUNY Oswego and went on to complete her master's degree in geography from Michigan State University. She grew up in upstate New York and was a frequent visitor to Lake Ontario before moving to Michigan where she was able to travel to the rest of the Great Lakes. Uh, we also have Joe Haas, uh, who's the um, District Supervisor from the Water Resources Division, the Gaylord Field Office, at the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Joe is employed in the environmental regulation uh, for over 20 years. He's very experienced in wetlands protection, inland lakes and streams, and Great Lakes. His professional interests include oil spill cleanup and mitigation. He's worked in oil wildlife collection, and natural resources damage assessment and restoration with experience in both the Gulf of Mexico BP spill response, as well as Enbridge Line 6B, the Kalamazoo River spill response. And he's been the district supervisor since 2013. We have Megan Anderson, who's the director of the Charlevoix Sheboygan Emmett County Office of Emergency Management. Megan has been in emergency management for 11 years. She's been with the Emmy County Office of Emergency Management since 2012. She's been the director since 2016. She's been through multiple declared events and worked through hazard mitigation planning and grants. She serves on the Northern Michigan Area Security Committee with the Coast Guard. She's the chair of the Region 7 Homeland Security Planning Board and has been appointed by Governor Whitmer to the Michigan Citizen Community Emergency Response Coordinating Council. Her prior experience downstate 
was with the Region 2 Urban Area Security Committee and its various subcommittees working on Homeland Security Strategies as a Solution Area Planner. As I mentioned previously, I'm Jennifer McKay. I'm the Policy Director for the Tippmann Watershed Council. I have been with the Watershed Council since 20, 2005. I'm responsible for the federal Great Lakes Basin-wide state and local policy and advocacy to improve the letter, level of protection for our water resources. I serve on the Great Lakes Commission and the Michigan Underground Storage Tank Authority being appointed by Governor Whitmer to both and previously served on the Michigan Pipeline Safety Advisory Board being appointed by former Governor Rick Snyder. We also have with us Ashley Sot Sotishek. Um, she's the Water Policy and Program Coordinator with the Watershed Council. She will be facilitating today's question and answer session. So the purpose of today's webinar um, is to provide information to shoreline property owners to assist with the high water levels that we are currently experiencing. Uh, the recent high water levels along the Great Lakes and Inland Lakes has led to an increase in shoreline construction proposals in an effort to address threats to homes and eroding shorelines. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is many of those proposals are poorly designed. They fail to consider the dynamic nature of the Great Lakes and these poorly engineered efforts are destructive to the ecological health of the lakes. They harm neighboring properties and they potentially create navigate, navigational hazards. So the webinar is designed to provide shoreline property owners with guidance in addressing high water issues in a manner that's both ecologically and economically responsible. In addition, although the Great Lakes shorelines grab attention as shorelines erode and houses fall into the water, inland flooding is a similar concern for Northern Michigan. We have high groundwater tables which means inland lakes and the residents are susceptible to environmental contamination and public health risks. Inland flooding could result in um, flooded and failing septic systems and drain fields, contaminated drinking water wells, and a release of chemicals or fuels from flooded basements or garages. So we'll be providing information to homeowners in hopes that these issues can be avoided and both shoreline property owners and our water resources can be protected. So you can see the topics that will be covered today. Um, and so with that, we will move to our first speaker, um, which is Deanna Apps. Okay, I hopefully you'll be seeing my screen here. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. I am Deanna Apps. I work out of the Detroit district for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And um, I'm going to be talking about Great Lakes water levels. I'll kind of go over uh, some hydrology of the basin and then I'll get into our six month forecast. Um, so as we get started, I know this, this slide has a lot of text, but I just want to start by going over just some notes about Great Lakes water levels so we're all on the same page. So first, Great Lakes water levels are measured not as a depth, but as an elevation above sea level um, in reference to the International Great Lakes Datum of 1985. Um, as you hear me go through this presentation, um, you'll hear me reference Michigan here on as one lake. Uh, because they're connected at the Straits of uh, Mackinac hydraulically, we consider them one lake for our reporting and forecasting purposes. So you'll hear me say Lake Michigan here on. Um, on our webpage, you can access lake-wide daily average water levels for each of the Great Lakes. Um, and then at the end of the month, we take the average of those uh, daily lake-wide average water levels and we compute uh, lake-wide monthly mean water levels. And that's really the main data set that we report out at the Corps of Engineers. Um, we calculate those lake-wide daily means using a network of water level gauges. And we do this so that the water level is more of a reflection based on still water and there's not localized influences of uh, meteorological forcings of wind uh, at one specific gauge. Uh, so we use a few gauges for each of the lakes to help calculate that daily lake-wide average. 
um, at the Detroit district. Uh, we technically are the keeper of official monthly water level statistics um, from our period of record goes back to 1918 to 2019. Um, and we do coordinate that data set with Environment and Climate Change Canada. We work very closely with them. We also coordinate our six month forecast with them as well, which I will talk about later. Um, and as you'll hear me uh, talk about throughout this presentation is that really the primary drivers of water level fluctuations are changing weather patterns and that resulting fluctuation in water supply. Um, so I also just like to usually start off the presentation just giving an overview of the basin um, I'm probably, you know, everybody on here has a good idea of, you know, the Great Lakes Basin, either from living in the basin or traveling to the basin. Um, you can see everything on that, in that image on the right, everything highlighted in green is what we consider the Great Lakes Basin, you know, covering over 14,000 miles of shoreline. And it is an international basin where we, it covers eight states and two provinces. On the bottom left diagram, uh, this is a side profile view, view of the basin, and that really allows us to see how water flows through the system. So as you can see, water starting in Lake Superior flows through the St. Mary's River into Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, uh, through the St. Clair River into Lake St. Clair, through the Detroit River into Lake Erie, through the Niagara River over the Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, and then out through the St. Lawrence River. Uh, I also like to note on this slide that there are two places in the system where outflows are regulated. Uh, the first being through the St. Mary's River from Lake Superior into Lake Michigan Huron and out of Lake Ontario through the St. Lawrence River. Uh, regulation of these uh, outflows is the responsibility of their respective boards of control. So the International Lake Superior Board of Control and the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board of Control and that's all under the authority of the International Joint Commission. Uh, I want to stress that the regulation of outflows, however, cannot prevent uh, extreme high or low water levels, nor can it fully control water levels. Uh, water levels are mainly driven by uh, weather or mother nature. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the factors that are impacting water levels. So we have a term that we call net basin supply. Um, and that's really the, the main three meteorological factors that impact water supplies. And that's precipitation to the lake, runoff to the lake, and evaporation off of the lake. Um, so, and that's, like I said, a term we call that basin supply. Of course, we also have to account for inflows from the upstream lake. So in the case of Lake Michigan Huron, that would be inflow from the St. Mary's River. And then outflow from the lake as well in Lake Michigan Huron's place would be the St. Clair River. So water levels go through a seasonal cycle every year. Um, typically we see the seasonal low in water levels during the winter. This is when the snow is accumulating, the ground is typically frozen, um, and that's when we see that seasonal low. As we get into the late winter, early spring, as we start seeing snow melt um, and increased runoff and uh, increased precipitation, typically as rain, we start to see water levels begin to rise. Um, and typically they will rise through most of the spring until they reach early, mid or late summer. Um, and that's when we see the peak in water levels. Um, and during this time in the summer, we have increased sunshine, which warms the lake water, which is very important as we head into the fall months um, where we typically see the seasonal decline in water levels due to increased evaporation. And evaporation really occurs um, when that colder air starts to move over the Great Lakes region and it's moving over these relatively warm lake surface waters. And that really what induces that uh, a significant amount of evaporation and is really the main driver of water level decline in that fall and early winter. So this is our full period of record of water levels. You can see that there's um, uh, graphics for each of the lakes, Superior, Michigan, Huron, St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. Uh, this is again, monthly mean water levels. Uh, that's the blue line uh, going back to 1918. Um, the red line across is the long-term average annual level. And just for the sake of narrowing it down to look at, I'll specifically talk about Lake Michigan Huron here, which is the second graphic down from the, from the top of the page. Um, and, and when you look back at the period of record, you can identify periods of high and, and low water. 
um, you know, we can see a, a period of higher water here in the late 20s. Um, you know, we could see a lower water period here in the mid 30s. Um, you know, you can see again that period of high water in the in the mid 80s, as a lot of people remember that. Um, and then most recently, um, you know, what people remember is the decade plus of low water with record lows. In the late 90s, we transitioned um, to uh, a very low water period um, on Lake Michigan Huron, which culminated in a record low of January in January 2013. Um, and then after that, we saw a couple years of really a record rise in water levels. And, and then really since then, annually, we've seen a fairly steady rise in Great Lakes water levels, which have brought us to some of the record high water levels we've seen in 2019 and 2020. So this slide summarizes the records uh, that we saw in 2019 and 2020 so far. Again, these are monthly mean water levels. So you can see after the large spring rise in water levels last year, uh, we started to set records on some of the lakes um, in May of 2019. So Superior, St. Clair, and Erie all set records in beginning in May, and it lasted on those three lakes until September of 2019. Um, Lake Ontario also joined the club in June and July of 2019 um, and set record high monthly mean water levels in those respective months. You can see the asterisks next to Erie and Ontario in June and Lake St. Clair in July. Um, those are there because not only did they set the record for that respective month, um, that is also now the highest monthly mean on record for all months in our period of record going back to 1918. Um, you can see the last three months of 2019, we didn't set any records, although we were very close. Uh, but things began again in 2020. Um, in January, we set records on Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, and uh, Lake St. Clair. Um, and actually in uh, Michigan Huron, we've set uh, a monthly mean water level record the first four months of 2020. Um, and we've also uh, set records on Lake Erie as well so far in 2020. So record high water levels have continued um, into this year as well. So why are levels so high? And, and really what it, what it comes down to is really since that 2013 uh, timeframe, we've really seen a wet pattern or a wet regime in the region. And it's been especially wet the last couple years. Uh, what you're looking at on this graphic is Great Lakes Basin precipitation. This is annual precipitation, so January to December. Um, and this data goes back to 1895. This is uh, from NOAA. So this is actually uh, data all on the US side of the basin. Um, and you can see the, the annual precipitation over time, you know, from basically 1895 to the last current full year of 2019. And you can see, especially what I've noted here is these last three years especially um, have been exceptionally wet in the region. Um, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this. A lot of places in Michigan, Wisconsin, um, have had their record wettest year in 2019. Um, even after coming off in, in some places, having a record wet year in 2018 as well. Um, so we've really seen um, some consistent uh, wet years in the basin, which has really helped us or helped water levels transition from that period of record low to now a period of record high. So this is our current water level so far in May uh, from our website. I've included the link down at the bottom um, this is uh, data through uh, the 12th of, two, since so full day of Tuesday, I believe. Um, you can see the daily water level report here. This is for each of the lakes, again, Superior, Michigan, Huron, St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. You can see the daily water levels and then the monthly means, which I've highlighted here below. I've also highlighted the maximum um, in the year that it occurred. Um, you can see right now that especially Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Lake St. Clair currently are tracking again to set records um, in the month of May. Um, Lake Erie is slightly below right now its monthly mean um, record, and, and it, they're below on, on Lake Superior and Ontario um, as well for now. And of course, you know, we're only, you know, not even halfway through the month, so, you know, things can change, obviously. Uh, but again, just wanted to highlight this, um, especially if you want to access the data on our website. So now I'm going to transition to the six month forecast. And before I kind of go into any of the details, I want to spend a little bit of time of 
understanding how to read this graphic. Um, so what you're looking at, this is the Lake Superior water level uh, six month forecast graphic. Um, and these graphics are based on, are really based on uh, chart datum. So this zero line that you're seeing on the graphic is chart datum. And that chart datum is different for each of the lakes. Um, for Lake Superior, the chart datum is referenced to 601.1 feet or 183.2 meters. Um, your feet axis is here on the left. Your meters axis is here on the right. Um, and what each of these lines is about plus two inches or minus two, depending on what direction you're going in. You know, in this case, we're, you know, the water levels are above chart datum. So we're plus uh, two inches, plus four inches, so on and so on. So you get to plus one feet, plus two feet. And that's, I said, again, in reference to that chart datum. So um, that's kind of, that's how you read these graphics. Um, in the blue, the blue dash line here, that's your long-term average monthly mean water levels for each of the months. And here, and, and that also allows you to see what the typical seasonal cycle is of each of the lakes. Um, and then the red line is what has occurred uh, since in the past two years. So this is the actual monthly mean water levels from May 2018 to April 29 or April 2020. Then you get into the forecast. So this green dash line is the what we call the most probable, or that's what um, you know what we base uh, the you know what we call the most probable or projected forecast. Uh, that red band that you're seeing there that represents a pretty much a 90% confidence range of water levels, um, you know, for the forecast. So if we're wetter than normal, we would expect to be toward the top of that band. If we're drier than normal, we would expect water levels to maybe follow more closely to the bottom part of that band. And then you can see I've highlighted a couple things here as well. Well, I, actually, I should mention that these dashed lines here with the year above it, those are your record highs at the top and the record lows at the bottom and the years that those occurred. You can see what I've highlighted here. These are the record highs from 2019 on Lake Superior uh, from May through September. The provisional records here are outlined by the purple arrows for January and February of 2020. Um, and then, you know, you can see the forecast. So we are in the period of seasonal rise on Lake Superior. Um, to give you a reference to last year, the April 2020 monthly mean level was within an inch of April 2019. So we're very close to last year's levels on Lake Superior. Um, and currently the forecast again, or that green dash line, the most probable, the forecast indicates uh, that water levels will be two to six inches below record high levels over the next six months. Now transitioning to Lake Michigan Huron, again, now that we're uh, just, I'm, I'm not gonna spend that time going over the graphic again, but you can see uh, again, those record high levels of in 2020 for January, February, uh, January, February, March, and April. Um, you can see that really the, re the main reason why Lake Michigan Huron has uh, really started to set records in 2020 has been really the lack of seasonal decline this spring and early winter. And a lot of that had to do with the very wet fall we had and the very warm winter months of December and January, which really decreased the amount of evaporation that occurred off of the lake. Um, and so now the most, you know, we are in the period of seasonal rise on Lake Michigan Huron. The forecasted peak is currently for the month of July. Um, our April 2020 level was 13 inches um, above the April 2019 level. So we are tracking about a foot above last year right now. Um, and currently the forecast does show, you know, record high water levels to, to continue through July uh, and likely August, supposed to be near its record high level in August. And then before falling below records come the fall time period. Um, on Lake St. Clair, again, you can see those records from May through September of 2019 um, in that, highlighted in that yellow uh, box there. And then you can see the water level records in January, March, and April of 2020 so far. Um, we're pretty much still in the period of seasonal rise, although it probably won't rise too much more. I, um, it's likely uh, we're gonna be reaching its peak over the next month or so. Um, the April 2020 level was eight inches above uh, last year's uh, April level. Um, and we are likely to see uh, a water level record in May, uh, forecast to be one inch above. 
Um, and then, but then as we get into the summer, we're expecting water levels to be a few inches below those records from last year in 2019. Lake Erie is a similar story here. Um, again, you can see the records from May through September. We've, con we've continued to see records in 2020 in February, March, and April. It is likely though that uh, er Lake Erie has reached its peak level um, and it will likely remain relatively steady in May or potentially decline if these dry conditions continue. Um, April 2020 level was still above last year's level by nine inches. Um, and we do forecast it to be near its record May level from last year. But then as, like I said, as we get through the summer and fall to be below some of those records that we saw last year in 2019. And finally, Lake Ontario, again, you can see those records from June and July. Um, so far, no records for this lake in 2020. We're still tracking slightly higher than last year as the April 2020 level was seven inches above last year's April level. Um, not really forecasted to see record highs on this lake, uh, but is still forecasted to be well above average over the next six months. So just wrap up with some key points. Um, water levels on the Great Lakes uh, really have started 2020 higher than 2019, and they all pretty much remain that way except for Lake Superior, um, which is fairly close to last year's levels. Except for Lake Michigan Huron, all lakes are forecasted to peak below 2019 levels. Again, Lake Michigan Huron will, will likely continue to see record high water levels over these next couple months. Uh, again, water level fluctuations are primarily driven by weather patterns. Um, and then again, as I mentioned earlier, regulation of outflows cannot prevent extreme high or low water levels. And lastly, the impacts of high water are expected, are expected to be felt throughout 2020. And I'll just leave here with uh, some water level contact information, my contact information there at the bottom, uh, Deanna Apps, my phone number and email. Uh, John Alice is my supervisor, can also answer questions related to water levels. And um, this is our Great Lakes High Water webpage. It has a lot of great resources on it um, and, and contact information if you need to reach out to the Corps of Engineers. Um, and that's all I have, and I'll transition it back to uh, the next presenter. Thank you, Deanna. That was fantastic. Um, before moving to our next speaker, um, I have a poll um, because the funding for today's webinar came from um, the local community foundations. I want to see how many of those in attendance uh, reside in Emmett and Charlevoix counties. Voting is slowing down. All right. I will go ahead and end the polling and share the results with everyone. So actually, the majority of people joining us um, are not from Emmett and Charlevoix County, but that's okay, that's great. Um, so our next speaker um, is Joe Haas from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. So I will turn it over to you, Joe. Great, thank you. Let's see if we can get that. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to shift gears a little bit away from the Great Lakes here. Um, Joe, we can't see your screen just yet. Oops, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Might just be an internet lag.
Let me know when you can see it, Jen. I've got a reply from somebody that they can see it. Okay. So let me just move ahead. Sure. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit from away from the Great Lakes. We've, as a department, Eagle has done a, a few of these town halls focused on Great Lakes um, shorelines. And um, we just are now getting our arms around the inland lake issue. And that's uh, really what my focus here is going to be. Um, 301 is the state of Michigan's Inland Lakes and Streams Protection Act. And that's part of Act um, 451 of 1994, the, the Michigan Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act for those that um, are interested in the actual regulations. And these are, are regulations that were um, combined in, in um, 1994. And sometimes you'll hear this referred to as NARIPA. Um, it's not the same as the National Environmental Policy Act, which you'll hear as NEPA. Easily to conf easy to confuse those. Um, but what I'm talking going to talk about is the statute and rules associated with Part 301 in and lakes and streams um, of Act 451. And so, if you wanted to research this for yourself, there's you know there's two separate documents: the statute and associated rules. Links, you can find links available um, through the Eagle permitting websites and you could just search, do a Google search on Eagle permitting. Um, and that's probably the easiest thing to do. You could contact me or any other um, Eagle staff and they could, should be able to steer you towards those. Towards those. A uh, word of caution would be to, to don't, I mean, read them certainly if you're interested in them, but don't try and interpret them for yourself. Contact field staff in the county you, you need to work in um, and they can help you navigate down the interpretation of them you should be coordinating with um, before implementing any type of field project. Hey, Joe, sorry to interrupt. I'm getting a lot of people saying they can still only see you in your background. Hmm. Is that a display setting issue? Um, the bottom of your screen, hit share screen, the green button. No fun zone. just watching me talk. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's getting going. There you there. go. There. Much better. There you go. Except you want to do. Uh... Does that work? Yep. But then go back to display settings at the top. Well, I'm switched. Yep. Switcheroo. There you go. How's that? Oh, look Perfect. at that. Thank you. Yeah, but I can see myself. I don't like that. I'll have to live with that. Um, in any case, so this is this slide represents what I was just talking about. Um, the next slide, so talking about part 301 and just some of the regulated activities, things you need a permit for 301 to do. So you need a permit to dredge or fill in a lake or stream um, to construct materials, uh, you know, construct structures, place a structure on, on, uh, on and within a lake and stream. Um, marinas need a permit and that's a little bit squirrely. We don't have an operating permit, but it is a permit that's required to construct or reconfigure a marina. I don't want to belabor that point. It's a, a difficult um, issue for us oftentimes to enforce, um, but you need a permit to create and or diminish in the lake or stream. So that's really oftentimes what we're talking about. The, the enlarge or diminish. So if you're placing fill in a flooded, uh, a flooded lake, um, you need a permit for that. Um, to structurally interfere with streams or, or the natural flow of it in the lake as well needs, needs permits. So we have um, authorities, that's just some of part 301. There's a couple other, you know, that's not an exhaustive list. There are a couple other regulated activities uh, connecting waterways or um, I'm trying to think maybe uh, removing um, uh, submerged logs. Not something you're likely to come across very commonly. And uh, public trust is an important aspect of what we do. Um, public trust is public trust rights are defined in Part 301 rules. So you have a right as a as a riparian or as a, a member of the public um, to 
navigate and fish in, in navigable waters. Navigable is oftentimes the crux of that argument. I'm not going to get into that in this discussion, but um, you may at some point, if you're a, a riparian or have an interest in this aspect, uh, we have the state has a duty to protect this public trust right, right, rights to navigate and fish, the right of the public to air, water, and and other natural resources. And you could even say that the you know public has a right to clean air, clean water, and um, you know appropriately managed natural resources. And the state has a duty to protect these resources again from pollution. Um, or impairment and destruction. So this is really why we do what we do. And it stems from old Roman law and old English law when the king could fence in, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres and say every natural resource is within, you know, their acreage and you can't um, take any other uh, fish or any other wildlife and you could be, you know, sentenced to all kinds of uh, dastardly deeds. Um, and we've carried the, that old English law uh, of public trust over to the United States. Also, riparian rights are important when you're talking about in the lakes and streams. Um, these are also defined in Part 301 rules. Uh, riparian rights are associated with the ownership of riparian property, so typically lakefront or um, riverine property. And, and riparian law is very thorny and, and difficult to often to navigate. Uh, it's hardly ever very straightforward. Um, you can picture a, a Picture a pizza pie sliced, uh, you know, circular pizza pie cut um, in regular pieces, and that's oftentimes how riparian ownership would run. You own a lot, which would sort of be the crust, and then uh, the rest of that pizza pie being under the lake water could, is typically um, owned by that adjacent riparian. It's not always the case, though. Um, riparian rights include access to dockage um, and general use of the water, and that could be for bathing or um, different domestic uses, and title to natural accretions um, that are subject to the public trust. So you can't be violating the public trust um, with your riparian usage. Um, but also with the natural accretions, what we're seeing now with high waters is sort of the opposite of that, the avulsion or the, uh, the removal of property because it's becoming submerged by expanding lakes and floodwaters. One of the most common exemptions to the law is a seasonal structure exemption. And that's typically um, used for a seasonal dock. So you own riparian property, you can put a seasonal um, non-commercial private dock out um, to moor a boat, right? Or a boat in a jet ski. Um, but and the key to this uh, aspect of the uh, of the regs and this exemption is that it can't unreasonably interfere with other other folks use other riparians use or public trust uses so you can't just put a dock that that uh, goes out an unreasonable amount uh, of length and could cause a navigation problem and cause a you know accident and and be a, a hazard to other water users that can legally use that water body and you can't put a dock out that encroaches on your riparian neighbors and their interest areas that are, uh, you know, they carry an equal interest in that um, frontage that they own. Um, so when you were talking about permitting, um, we use, we now have what's called the last few four years, we've had a MyWaters uh, web-based permitting process. Um, so all permit applications are submitted electronically through MyWaters. Uh, we try to do everything electronically. It's our portal, if you will, for, you know, most of our actions nowadays. Um, you, again, apply for permits through My Waters. You can manage them in My Waters, pay, uh, pay the fees through My Waters, um, view issued permits if you're uh, just a member of the public interested in what's going on, what's been in, um, what may have been issued in your neighborhood or something that's got your interest. Um, you should be able to view that. You don't need an account in My Waters to do that. Um, and you can review evaluations and site inspections and things that are published in My Waters. It, so this includes um, a graphic site map explorer. So if you only have, say, a location without an address, you can look into the map and map to that point and, and look at the information that's uploaded into My Waters. And importantly, you can also um, report complaints. Um, we oftentimes, I think we get most of our complaints, honestly, through phone calls. And then we have to enter it. It's a little bit of work. But if we can turn the corner and get people filing the proper complaint um, materials in my waters that saves us saves us some extra steps and some extra work um, 
and this is uh, the joint permit application would be submitted in my waters. This is what it looks like. Um, and it, it really covers all of the different authorizations that the um, that Eagle has. I see us as MEDQ in there. Um, that's that's what we used to be. Eagle used to be DEQ, and so that's a an antiquated reference that I need to fix in my presentation. I apologize for that. But it's really all done through the joint permit application, and it's joint permit because we share this with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, you apply through my waters and the Army Corps gets a copy of it as well. So if they have jurisdiction, they can um, engage with their process as well. So it's not, uh, it's relatively seamless and should be less painful for the applicant. Um, a little more streamlined. So at the issue at hand, what we're dealing with now, and you can see this photograph was taken some months ago, um, it is high waters and flooding. They've been a common experience um, in recent years. Um, as Deanna was just discussing, you know, the last three years, we've really seen an uptick in, in water levels. And across Michigan and across the region, and particularly in the northern areas, we're seeing these uh, affected residents and businesses um, within, um, within our northern region, north of Clare, uh, roughly. Um, and, you know, negatively impacting uh, um, homes, wells, septic systems. Um, agriculture has been struggling with this across the state with the high water. Um, infrastructure and utilities such as, uh, you know, utility lines, um, roads and drains and such. So, you know, we expect this is going to last several year years. We don't have a crystal ball. Nobody can say for certain when this is going to go away. We do know it's a, a cyclical um, issue, right? Um, and as, as Deanna did say, the Great Lakes are, you know, being at or near and sometimes above, you know, ordinary high levels and, and record levels, um, inland lakes are experiencing the same thing. Um, so I describe it oftentimes to, to people asking about it as these lakes have, are getting bigger. Um, so you can see this um, residential structure here that this is a lake near the Gaylord Field Office and um, it's encroaching into this individual's private property and right close to their house. So um, this is becoming a, a, an area of, of grave concern to uh, residential owners, uh, among others. And so the issues that we're dealing with are, again, expanding lakes, potential structure damage, um, and all the associated things that go along with that. You know, septic fields, uh, drinking water wells can be at threat. You can see there's a well in the center of this um, photograph that's, you know, five, ten feet from the static water edge. Um, you don't want water getting into that well. If water overtops that well, it can contaminate the well. Um, it could contaminate the aquifer. We don't want to see that happening. There's um, different things you can do to, to protect against that. Um, there's extensions that can be put on that well um, it, before the water gets to it. Um, the other issues that are commonly seen is floating debris, um, floating and submerged debris for that matter. Um, electrocution hazards aren't mentioned on this slide, but if you're approaching your, your summer home for the first time this year and, and it's got you know, areas that are submerged that may have um, electrical conduits in them, you wanna be very careful. Uh, so another, the, the issue of floating debris, um, just another photograph of it. Um, it's gonna be an issue for navigation and boating hazards. Coast Guard's well aware of this for some of the bigger waters, um, but it's gonna be an issue on all of our navigable waters, all of our waters we boat on inland as well. Um, we're, we've started to see complaints and hear complaints and see the issue of oily sheens from household chemicals and oils. And I think Jen mentioned this in her introduction. Um, you know, we recommend that owners pay particular attention to you know, your, your garage, your, your basement, your utility shed, get, you know, get them cleaned out, get materials up off the floor, similar, uh, similarly like you might think of any type of flood, you know, pre-flood activity, you're gonna wanna get that material uh, up and away from the water body and, and uh, make sure we don't end up contaminating our surface waters. We are starting to hear, uh, hear of different um, complaints of sheens and, and other, other potential issues. So here I have a set of uh, four, it'll be four separate um, aerial um, images. 
And this is on a, a lake again near the Gaylord Field Office. And this goes between 1998 and 2017. So mo modern higher waters you'll see. Um, and this span, span of years really clearly shows the changing of water levels. Um, you know, in 98, it was pretty low. Um, and then you'll see uh, in 2010, it got quite low. You can see in the center of that, um, there's a, a home structure and they've got a dock right at the edge of the water. Um, the different colored uh, topographic lines are LIDAR um, topographic um, lines that show the lay of the landscape and their one foot contour. So if you look to the little peninsula to the left where the home has a cul-de-sac or a, a roundabout driveway there, he's on a hill. That house is, that structure is up on a hill. You can see from the closely, closely spaced topographic lines. But then when you move to the right, the house that's in the center has some great spaces between those topographic lines. So that tells us that's a much more gradual, um, a gradual slope. So they're gonna be much more readily threatened when waters start to come up. And we'll see that from 2010 to 2014, you see their deck or their dock is already out in the water and you're gonna to have to get wet to get to it. And waters are starting to come up. And we go now to 2017 and water's right at the edge of that house. So at this point, probably before this point, these owners realize they've got trouble. Um, and there's a lot of people that are in this situation right now. Um, this was one of the earlier scenarios because of the, the nature of, the, of this home being built so low in the landscape. Um, and then in this image, you can see there's a, actually a, a sandbag wall that they've put out in front of it. Um, that's the lighter colored um, linear feature that you see lakeward of that home, it's in the middle. Um, and so we were attuned to this, it's very close to the office again. And so we did a lot, quite a few number of site inspections out here trying to just to document and keep an eye on it. And this is what we found in one of the inspections over this past winter um, the sandbag wall that was built before the water came up. And you'll see in the distance, there's a trash pump. And if this video works, you can um, get a real feel for what they're doing here. So you see they were pumping with a trash pump behind the sandbag wall to, to, to get the water away from the house. In this image, you can see the, the house is on the upper right corner and it was being inundated by the lake. Um, you can see they put an extension on the well. That's the, uh, the pipe structure that's just below that house. And then the green crock that they put in the center, that's a tile system that they put in behind the sandbags. So they have to pump the water down in order for this uh, pump that's inside of this crock, this green crock, in order for that to, to kick in and then um, the tiles really function well and um, kick the water back to the other side of those bags. But this is a problem with the groundwater table and without the pumps running, the house has continued to be inundated. And it's a very expensive and labor intensive way to uh, get rid of water in, in the lake. But I think what one of the points I was wanting to make with this slide is that they put this bag up, these bag walls up before the water came to this thing and, it, and they seem to function better at holding water back. They still won't hold the groundwater back, um, but they do, they do allow this individual to pump the water to the other side of this house. So it was sort of a temporary fix, although very uh, expensive and labor intensive. So again, this, this stuff is expensive. Um, there's alternatives to doing this, right? Avoiding vertical walls is a big issue. Um, you know, that sandbag wall is a temporary measure. Putting pumps in is a very temporary measure. Um, if they couldn't, you know, they ended up moving that house, actually lifting it up by three cinder blocks worth um, and, that, and then filling around it. 
um, to, to gain a more normal setting. Um, but the professionals will help you do that. And there's consultants that can help you navigate my waters when you need to get permits. Um, we would typically require a permit for that. And then the other thing, so when people see this high water, uh, the first, one of the first thing they currently, uh, we, we typically see is they want a hard armor or seawall the shoreline back where the, what they would call the ordinary line would have been. And that's oftentimes viewed by a, a proponent as a permanent protection measure, but what you'll end up is with water behind the wall anyways. Um, and so, you know, we, we as an agency, we've come, we sort of turned the corner on seawalls. Nowadays, we've pushed back. We don't like to permit seawalls. You know, seawalls don't absorb wave energy in the same manner as say aquatic vegetation or natural vegetation. Uh, the flat or sometimes corrugated steel walls, that material reflects almost all of like a boat wakes energy or wave energy back into open water. It can accentuate a, um, erosion on adjacent properties. Um, and so, you know, shoreline modifications like that are really frowned upon and we push back on those sort of approaches. Um, the other thing we're seeing now too is, is folks proposing to draw down a, a flooded lake with a whole water or a whole lake drawdown projects. That's going to require a permit from us as well. Um, you're going to have to be considering, uh, you know, issues with down gradient um, water. Where are you going to put it in this landscape that's already flooded? Um, any potential aquatic invasive species? Um, there's just liability issues with moving water. Um, and you've got to be very cautious and it's got to be well planned out uh, projects. Oftentimes you'll have to establish a legal lake level, which is a, a bit of a lengthy um, legal process that's got to be done um, to, and would typically um, establish a summer and winter level. Um, so here's what, some of the things that we're going to consider, uh, you know, adverse effects to the public trust and impacts to riparian rights. If you want to draw down the whole lake, um, that's a big issue. It also is an issue for seawalls. Are there feasible and prudent alternatives? Um, you know, Eagle is required to consider that and the applicants are going to be required to provide us with an explanation of what alternatives were considered and why they didn't um, implement them. Again, downstream impacts with a discharge. If you want to dewater a lake or a property, you can't cause detrimental impacts to any receiving locations. Um, we we're going to be very mindful about uh, about impacting any wetlands or downstream watersheds, and you're probably going to have to monitor it. So whole lake drawdowns can be very expensive. Um, softer approaches that are something we encourage and we've been a proponent of for a number of years and are pushing it strongly is quarter logs instead of instead of rock, certainly instead of steel, corrugated steel walls. Um, we like to see bioengineering, just natural natural vegetation. Temporary sandbags can be appropriate, but it's, it's, it's just that, it's temporary for the sort of immediate prevention if you, if you got water coming close to your structure and you need to, um, to dewater for a temporary fix. It's much easier to prevent flooding than to try to dewater flooded areas. Uh, I've been saying that for the whole year now. So again, that house on the left, they put those sandbags in um, before the water got to those structures and it, and it kind of holds, right? The wall is holding the you know three or four feet of water behind it. The photograph on the right is a, a different lake in the in Otsego County, where they put these sea, these sandbags in the water after it was already flooded and it didn't seal. Um, it's just not something that's functioned right. They they're running all kinds of pumps. This they had two pumps here to keep them from uh, to avoid um, freezing over winter, but it's still they were never really able to. I never saw any real drawdown out here. It just didn't, didn't they, they couldn't get the pumps to keep up with the water and what you're effectively doing is pumping groundwater anyways. So what does this all mean? So the sponge is full, right? Landscape is, is saturated, um, especially in this Northern region. We've got more flooded lakes than I think any other district. Um, just the nature of our coarse soils and the amount of, of water and, and the, the excellent natural features that we have around here, right? The, um, the cottage country and the vacation land that we in the North country get to live in. Um, 
these are kettle hole lakes typically that we see they're they're struggling with flooding they don't have a natural outfall or have an established illegal lake level so they don't have a dam control in an outfall structure um, but these are lakes that are getting larger flooding out structures and infrastructure private homes um, and you do need an, a permit from from water resource division of eagle to place fill into surface waters and that includes surface waters that are part of a lake that has gotten bigger. Um, I can't stress that enough. We are working to help expedite permits. Um, if you've got a risk, you know, can demonstrate there's a risk to human health and safety, critical infrastructure and homes, um, we'll work with you to get a permit fast. And that's, you know, you really need to demonstrate that in your um, application. Oftentimes, um, it can be demonstrated with photographs or with a narrative. Um, we do have some emergency permitting authority under Part 301 of the Inland Lakes and Streams Protection Act. We do not have emergency permitting authority under the Wetland Protection Act. So, um, it, you know, if you want to fill wetlands, that's a different issue. Um, it's going to take a little bit more of a, of a critical review. But um, if you've got an established property um, and you're experiencing high water and there's there's a demonstrated risk you know to health safety or infrastructure um, approach us please keep work with us uh, we will work with you to get a permit most most applications we receive end up in a permit they do not we have a reputation for being almost as nasty as the IRS and not issuing permits or issuing you know denials denials are the exception we don't issue a lot of denials we are we work with prop project proponents to modify their projects to get to a permitting place to issue a permit. We are a permitting agency. And then, you know, we are working to assist customers. So we do have a lot of information on websites and such. Um, we do have a frequently asked questions document and um, information sheets on, a, on our Inland Lakes High Water website. And if you just Googled Michigan Inland Lakes High Water, you should be able to get to the Eagle uh, website that has that information. You can call the Environmental Assistance Center and they can help you with that as well. Um, the trick is identify that you're calling about high water levels. And if you've already called field staff and they haven't been able to get you back, you know, to return your call and you want and you call the Environmental Assistance Center, please let them know, hey, I've already tried to call field staff and they, they haven't gotten back to me because otherwise you'll end up in a circular uh, call cycle where the assistant center just sends you back to the field staff that are overwhelmed right now with um, applications and trying to keep up with the work level that we have is nearly impossible. We're doing our best, um, but uh, make sure you're communicating with the environmental assistance center if you have questions. And then there's some tough questions. I don't know if I'm going to answer these right now, but maybe somebody at the end has uh, a question similar or wants to um, repeat these, but um, you know, really your private insurance is going to be responsible if your home floods. Most of these inland lake owners, I don't believe, carry flood insurance, but um, I, I don't know for a fact that, you know, what the situation is obviously with everybody. Um, we typically aren't going to find people for work. What we seek is restoration of natural resources. We're not interested in, in being punitive. Um, it's really restoration. Typically, if you do something that's out of sorts with the statute, you need to modify your project to come into compliance and, and restore natural resources. Um, we aren't allowed to suspend the laws um, and funding help is difficult. I think Megan is going to talk a little bit about that, but the state of Michigan does not have a pot of money available to help, especially it's just not available for single family residents. Um, it's not like the, like the East Coast if there's a hurricane and FEMA comes in to help rebuild. This is, we, we don't have a history of this kind of uh, regular um, impact. And so there's just no clear path to get res single family residents um, money to rebuild or to help. Um, again, Environmental Six Assistance Center can help you navigate this. And um, the phone number and, and emails are available in this presentation would be made available, I'm sure. And then just uh, to close things out, you can sign up for updates and subscribe. Again, um, if you have questions, call the Environmental Assistance Center and uh, 
I'm sure Jen can include my contact information um, on material that uh, follows these presentations. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Joe. Um, before we move on, we're going to do one more poll just to see who is in the audience listening. Um, and um, let's see. Um, and it's going to be you know, what best describes you know who you represent if you're a great lakes property owner in the lake property owner local government official contractor Got eighty three percent of the votes in. All right, and go ahead and end it. And um, you can see actually the majority of individuals are Great Lakes and Inland Lakes property owners, which is perfect since that's the focus of our webinar today. Um. So now I will um, go to my presentation and um, so Joe talked a bit about um, a lot of what I hope to talk about. So mine is really to reinforce it, um, is really to talk about um, the uh, shoreline protection measures that are taken when waters rise. And this impacts both inland lakes and Great Lakes property owners. And from the Watershed Council's perspective, when considering what actions to take along the shore to combat high waters, it's important to consider the health and dynamic vari variability of the lakes and the potential impacts not only on the waters, but on neighboring properties. So Again, we see excessive or poorly designed structures that can increase damage to neighboring properties and disrupt the natural processes along the shoreline. Um, and so Joe showed some of the photos where we see, you know, a lot of sandbags and sandbags are not effective for long term shore protection. They are not a preferred method of protecting against erosion as they're temporary. They can't withstand wave energy or ice movement. They break open and become litter and they can't and it impacts the water quality and wildlife on along the shore and in the lake um, and ultimately they slump and cannot hold the slope and shoreline erosion ends up occurring anyways um, and particularly we see uh, the use of Great Lakes bottomlands as a source of sand to fill sandbags which also has an adverse impact on the environment and public trust um, it re removes natural sand from the littoral drift process along the water's edge that provides necessary material for shoreline and beach creation, stabilization, erosion protection, and wave energy dispersal. Another thing we often see is excessive boulders or seawalls or in the picture on the left, it's actually concrete being put in. Uh, these are not ecologically preferred solutions. These options don't allow for the absorption of wave energy. And as the waves hit the large boulders or seawalls, the energy from the waves does not disappear. It's actually directed downwards and sideways. So that energy that's directed downwards actually erodes the lake bottom and a scouring of the lake bottom increases with wave height and it causes a loss of habitat. Um, so the seawalls and even revetments can cause wave flanking in which the wave energy is deflected sideways to your neighboring properties. So this can actually increase erosion on your neighboring neighbor's property or cause erosion where there might not have been any um, to begin with. So another way to see how these hard structures and armoring of the shoreline has negative impacts upon the health of the water um, 
and you can see that you know the seawalls deflect waves and cause scouring of the lake bottom. The scouring can reduce water clarity by churning up sediments. Um, it can also cause um, phosphorus to be released that can cause nuisance algae growth. Um, it can also provide uh, the ability with the disturbance to allow invasive species um, to, uh, to thrive in those areas. Um, and in particularly for inland lakes, the need for seawalls is often overstated. In most Michigan inland lakes, the wind speed, lake depth, and fetch, which is um, the longest straight line distance from your property to another side of the lake, are actually not great enough to warrant a seawall as protection from the forces of waves and ice. Another option, um, particularly for inland lakes, is bioengineering. Um, so Joe mentioned it, but uh, providing more information, bioengineering is a form of erosion control that incorporates biological, ecological, and engineering concepts to produce a living, functioning shoreline system through the use of live and dead plant material, native soils, and structural materials. And native natural shorelines can provide a much better alternative to hardened shorelines like sea walls or bulkheads. It provides fish and wildlife habitat, water quality benefits that may be lost with other stabilization methods, and it can be designed in conjunction with riprap for high energy systems, allowing the shoreline to be stabilized while providing the additional benefits to the lake ecosystems. Plants and shrubs and trees can also provide an attractive privacy screen for property owners while maintaining views of the lake. On shorelines where native vegetation has been removed, it's possible to restore the shore with a combination of methods um, such as bioengineering. It's usually less expensive than structural methods. Some applications can be done by the homeowner themselves and others might require a contractor. Um, the estimated cost of installing a natural shoreline, including the materials, um, averages about $10 to $20 per linear foot versus the financial cost of hard or armoring the shoreline can range from $45 up to $200 and up per linear foot. And the new planted areas, while they require some initial maintenance, once they're established, actually require little to no maintenance. Another option when existing homes are threatened by high water and erosion is to look at moving a home. So the costs and benefits of moving a structure back from the lakeshore um, should be weighed with the other alternatives. It could be comparably, it can compare favorably to the other alternatives and actually can prove to be economically, environmentally, and aesthetically better in the long run. And the process of moving a house is basically four parts, site preparation for the new location, building preparation, the actual move, and then setting the home in the new location. The process, um, you know, before the move, there's a number of items that need to be done. Uh, the homeowner, you can work with a contractor. Um, you leave all the contents in the house alone. Uh, working with the general contractor, you'll work on the site and building preparation and other aspects, including obtaining permits, disconnecting and reconnecting utilities, excavation, and laying the new foundation. Um, depending on the size and shape of the home, the actual moving of the structure can be completed within just a day or two. As you imagine, moving a house is not a flat fee type of service. There are many factors that go into the pricing of home moving, including square footage, as well as the structure's length, width, weight, and the construction method. Accessibility move distance and other obstacles such as power lines or structural integrity also factor into the cost of a move. As well, garages, additions such as porches and decks um, and other accessories can always be moved, but they can add time and increase the cost. So the total cost of actually moving a home can range from as little as 12,000 
for a ranch up to 100,000 or potentially more for larger, more complex sites. On average, the cost for the industry is between 12 to $16 per square foot. And the Watershed Council has um, a list of home movers, as well as does um, Eagle, uh, that is available on our website. And you can see the link down there, um, which I'll provide again. Um, here's a general list of home movers in Michigan. Um, I should note uh, that while the list um, was made available by Eagle, that um, neither Eagle nor the Watershed Council um, provided provides any recommendations um, on any of these builders. Um, it's just a list that has been provided. And as was previously mentioned, um, obviously inland water levels are extremely high and that's having a number of issues that we are seeing. One of them is on septic systems. And so just a quick um, rundown on how a septic system works. Uh, wastewater treatment in a septic system occurs in two stages. First, the wastewater from the home enters the septic tank where solid waste or sludge settles out and bacteria or other microorganisms consume most of those solids. The sludge then remains in the tank and needs to be pumped out periodically. Uh, the liquid waste then flows into the distribution system, usually a drain field, where it's dispersed into the soil. And here the wastes are further treated by microorganisms and chemical reactions in the soil. Some septic systems contribute much higher levels of pollutants than others. The location, design, age of the system can have a great influence on the effectiveness of the waste treatment. And other conditions that contribute to the pollution potential include soil type, depth of groundwater, system use, and frequency of maintenance. So as you can see, when you have a high water table, the septic system is un underwater. Um, in addition, you, when you have high water table, you can also have basement flooding, foundation damage, drinking water well contamination, um, contamination of inland lakes, and much more. So the signs of septic system failure include toilets or sinks backing up or draining slowly in spite of using a plunger or drain cleaner. Uh, wet areas, lush grass, or foul odors around the drain field, um, which indicate that effluent or liquid waste is surfacing. These are warning signs that the septic system is not functioning properly. And in shoreline areas, noticeable algae or plant growth or a distinctive colored patch of bottom sediment developing near the drain field can indicate excessive nutrient enrichment from a malfunctioning septic system. Um, so, in, if you, um, sorry, um, if you have a septic system that is submerged, um, that means there's no treatment going on. And that means it could pot potentially impact the surface waters. If that's the case, immediately call the local health department. You can also pump out your septic tank, re reduce water use, and fence off the area around the drain field to minimize um, contact with the wastewater. Uh, keep in mind that all of these are only temporary fixes. Uh, further action is required to assess and correct the problem. And in particular, pumping may not help if the household piping is clogged or if high water level is in fact the problem. And remember that a permit from the local health department is always required for repair, replacement, and new construction of a septic system. So always be sure to follow the requirements um, of the local sanitary code and hire only reputable septic system installation firms. The one important action that all shoreline property owners can observe is septic system maintenance. 
Um, septic systems that are failing or unmaintained can threaten both surface and groundwaters. And studies have shown that some pollutants carried by the groundwater beneath the septic system often reach surface waters from septic systems located within 300 feet of the shoreline. And nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus are the primary pollutant of concern. Nutrients can encourage excessive aquatic plant and algae growth with, which makes swimming and boating undesirable. And septic system fluent can also cause disease causing bacteria that can move to surface waters from septic systems, making it unsafe for swimming or other bodily contact. Contamination of groundwater from septic system fluent is particularly a concern when the groundwater is used for drinking water. And because shoreline areas have a high water table and septic systems are often very close to the water, the potential to negatively impact groundwater and surface water is significant. So a number of things that you can do, have your septic tank inspected and pumped regularly by a licensed pumper. The general recommendation of how often to do it is every three to five years. Of course, the right schedule is based upon the size of the septic tank, the number of individuals in your household, and the amount of wastewater generated. Heavier year-round use will necessitate more frequent pumping than light or seasonal use. Um, you can consider improving or upgrading your system if the amount of wastewater you generate is more than the septic system can handle. Um, you do not use commercial products that claim to be a substitute for maintenance pumping. Many of these products actually liquefy the sludge and cause it to enter the drain field. Likewise, avoid using harsh chemicals such as drain cleaner or large amounts of bleach because they kill the bacteria that, which actually break down the solid wastes in the septic tank. Install a vegetative buffer strip of deep rooted plants between the edge of your drain field and shoreline area. These plants can help absorb nutrients before they reach the water and take care not to plant deep rooted plants in the area directly over your drain field as the roots might cause damage to your system and result in wastewater that is not ad adequately treated. Uh, direct rainwater from gutters and other surface water away from your drain field because excessive moisture can saturate the soil even further and reduce the drain field's filtering capacity. You could construct a new septic system as far away from the shoreline as possible. Uh, do not apply fertilizer around the drain field because the nutrients saturate the soil and cause it to stop removing nutrients from the wastewater. And limit the use of your kitchen garbage disposal. It, um, heavy use adds large quantity of solids and it can shorten the time between septic tank maintenance. Um, you also want to ensure your septic system is functioning properly so you don't contaminate your drinking water well. Um, also, the casing on your drinking water well should extend at least 12 inches above the ground for sanitary protection. If the casing on your well becomes submerged, your drinking water can become contaminated. Likewise, if you don't have at least 12 inches of casing above ground, you don't have the same degree of protection from surface contamination. So as uh, Joe mentioned, while well, casing can easily be extended to ensure this minimum depth, in addition, you can also consider having a well contractor install a watertight cap. If a well does become submerged in surface water, um, we would immediately tell people not to drink the water. And if water reaches your well or covers the top of your well casing, assume your well is contaminated. Water from your well should not be used for drinking, cooking, or brushing your teeth. Health risks can occur from a contaminated well. Bacteria such as E. coli, rotavirus can be found in contaminated water along with deadly substances like lead and nitrate. You'll need to have your well disinfected as soon as possible and tested to ensure it's safe. And you can contact the health department and to do that testing. And Joe mentioned the other concerns with high waters, um, electrical currents. Um, we see a lot of uh, docks and marinas in public areas that have electrical hurt hookups, which may have the potential to shock someone um, that had, comes in contact with the water. People should avoid swimming off of docks or piers that are wired with electricity. Um, the water around the dock could be carrying lethal amounts of electricity, even if the source is 100 yards away. 
In addition, walking through wet or flooded basements can be dangerous. Um, never walk through a flooded basement until the electricity is disconnected. Um, move um, hazardous materials to safe areas that are likely to remain dry in the event of flooding. Um, particularly those that could pose a danger if their contents are released to the environment. Examples of that include um, vehicle batteries, propane tanks, drain cleaners, motor vehicle oil, antifreeze, pesticides, and fertilizers. And um, Joe did mention use um, extreme vigilance while boating. Uh, we have many piers and docks and breakwaters that are currently underwater and not visible. Um, and debris we're now seeing is a common issue. So using caution, um, particularly while boating at night. Um, and so I'm going to do one last poll. Um, what is your greatest concern with respect to high waters? Is it private property damage? Is it damage to public infrastructure such as roads or parks? Is it concern with the septic system failure or drinking water wells? Or is it something completely different? Okay, we have about 82% that have voted. So we'll go ahead and end the polling. And clearly with 71%, the majority of concern is with private property damage to the shoreline. And last but not least, we will turn it over to Megan Anderson, the director of the Charlevoix, Sheboygan, Emmett County Office of Emergency Management. Hello, everyone. Thank you for waiting patiently for me here. Uh, I think this looks set up on my end. Jennifer, does this come through like we practiced? Uh, did you fix your display settings. Oh, again? Let's see. Yep. Perfect. Okay. It swapped back, excellent. All right, well, thanks everybody for waiting for my part here. Uh, and I will have a little bit of information on the financial government assistance uh, potentially available, um, but I'm not going to be everybody's best friend. I would just like to lead on that foot. So I am the Director of Emergency Management for Charlevoix, Sheboygan, and Emmett Counties, and we'll just try to take you through this process here a little bit. So right now, to start at the top, an emergency declaration uh, typically happens after there is a very particular or specific disaster. So right now, the one that we're in uh, for COVID-19 is affecting the entire state. And so you saw how the governor did an automatic statewide declaration instead of making each county individually declare a disaster. So uh, for us to see something like this, uh, we would have to um, either wait to see each individual county reach some sort of level of damage that would impact their ability to function as like a municipality or as government before they could declare a disaster. Uh, because right now, the way that the declaration process is set up uh, for erosion specifically, it is not eligible. Um, erosion is a cyclical process. It doesn't really have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. Um, when you see a declaration happen, it's because of a, a particular specific instance. So um, we do know uh, through the state that the coastline, because of how much 
of the state of Michigan is the coastline. We understand the damage that it is doing, but it doesn't meet the criteria right now that we have to enact some of the emergency response um, quivers we have in that bow, so or in that container there. So um, we just want you to understand that that is not set up for that right now. It's not an eligible um, event. So something would have to change on a legislative level in order for a declaration like that to happen. So and over the years, uh, most of our critical infrastructure has either been fortified, uh, like wastewater treatment plants that are typically on the shoreline. Um, those are usually fortified to manage it or they've been moved away to, from coastal areas because of the volatility of the flood stages or erosion that happens. Uh, and that you guys are seeing right now. So that's why you'll see a lot of parks um, or private property uh, along the shoreline more so than um, where government does business and it's mostly because of the volatility. So uh, I went over this slide a little bit here, but um, erosion and its damages are not currently eligible for public assistance. Uh, right now, uh, there was a few articles and a few legislators who had discussed doing something like this, um, but that is all that there is right now. There is no process in place. There was only people talking about trying to make some sort of um, funding available uh, that would affect some of the shoreline, but that was also a little bit before the COVID-19, and that is going to take a substantial hit on government um, financial situations, both local, federal, statewide. Uh, if there was something set aside, it's probably been reappropriated right now. So uh, there is nothing new that's come from this, but again, that would come from scratch and that would come from legislators. It is not something that currently exists. So uh, when a declaration is called, um, uh, private damages are usually factored in there as a scale during damage assessment um, we'll, we'll have it in there so that we can see the widespread damage overall being caused um, but if what is going on here is that uh, it's only it's mostly private damage and it's not impacting local government in a way that would trigger a declaration then that private damage doesn't do anything on its own so that would not um, by itself be able to trigger a declaration as it's written so there is a difference between erosion and flooding. So you're gonna see some more of the flooding within the lakes. You're also gonna probably see some flooding along the regular shoreline there. Um, but those are mostly covered with the National Flood Insurance Program. So uh, especially in these three counties, Charlotte, Washington, and Emmett, some recent mapping has been done and some updates have been made as far as um, people's ability to access the National Flood Insurance Programs. Um, but you know, we here in this office don't administer that. You have to go direct with them in order to see what those policies would be like or go direct with the insurance companies that might offer it uh, through their facilities. Um, but there is a difference between some of that. So a lot of this has to do with um, you guys looking at your own personal homeowner proper, um, policies and determining what kind of damages can be um, can be uh, reimbursed through your insurance policy. So it might be that the shoreline isn't going to work, but maybe water in your basement can, depending on your policy. Rising water is different uh, from uh, wave damage and things like that. So there are a lot of particulars that you'll have to learn, but you will see that erosion is really not going to be on the list there with any of that. It would be uh, far too costly for private businesses, which is, why they don't insure it and uh, the government does not insure against erosion the way that it would uh, through the National Flood Insurance Program which helps some communities stay along the beaches and, and the coastal areas in the United States that we all love so much and that drives so much of our economy. So uh, flooding here from a single event might be eligible if we get a good big push um, and that would have been more likely something that would have come this springtime due to um, water runoff that we luckily did not see a lot of. Uh, so that type of flooding is, is considered usually eligible for a declaration. Um, but again, that public infrastructure damage has to be significant. Municipalities have to show a devastating financial cost and interruption of government. Um, there's a big process for damage assessment and, you know, and, and it has to be a specific incident. 
So a lot of what we've discussed today does not fit any of that bill. So some of those, uh, again, it, it's just not going to make the level of declaration that you would have liked to see. And you would have probably in the past, in the last few months, uh, it has quieted down. You did see some counties or municipalities attempt to sort of circumvent their emergency manager and go right to writing a letter or making a motion in a meeting to send to the state to sort of declare an emergency uh, because of the state that, that most of these homeowners were in. But it doesn't work like that. The process doesn't play out like that. There aren't mechanisms in place to take that and run it and end up with money in your pockets from it. So um, that's why you really didn't see any results from actions taken like that. Uh, there's just nothing set up in the legislature to um, to manage that. So um, again, uh, seasons, cyclical conditions, or multiple events over an extended time frame um, do not uh, meet FEMA's requirements for a uh, presidentially declared disaster. So, um, and even if they were, uh, sometimes you might get pretty close to that. There's only specific eligible costs that are allowed or even considered. So uh, within that, it would be pretty narrow what you would be able to recoup as well. So uh, for that, um, public assistance, for some work that would need to be considered eligible, it would have to fall under particular categories, and those are determined at the time that a declaration would take place. And that would be things like debris removal. So if there was a big flood that came through and you had to get a lot of uh, maybe houses that washed away um, managed, then that kind of debris removal might be in there or some emergency protective measures. Um, but a lot of what we would see otherwise um, categories for roads and bridges or water control facilities, public buildings, utilities, uh, they all have to be specifically approved as a part of that disaster. And again, that's um, difficult to get because of long-term uh, infrastructure being moved away from areas that are threatened by this type of damage. So not easy to get there. But some of the other funding through FEMA, uh, if they were to make some changes on a national level, and that's not something, honestly, I would, I would expect to happen here, um, individual disaster assistance does become available. So if you're doing your research and you see this, um, it would have to be a declared event. Uh, which I, I hope I made clear, this is not an easy thing to do for this type of event uh, or this type of issue. Um, for that, homeowners might be eligible, but it would have to be a presidentially declared event uh, and it wouldn't be able to duplicate any insured losses. And right now erosion does not come up for that unless they make changes at the federal level. Um, also secondary homes, uh, would not be eligible for any cost mitigation like that. It's only for primary residences. So anybody with a second home up here, even if we did get that far, uh, would not uh, see any, uh, any financial assistance from that. And your house pretty much has to be absolutely destroyed. Uh, like if you cannot fix it within uh, 30 days worth of contract work, then they consider that a destroyed property. But um, there, there are very significant hurdles to cross in order to get the type of restoration that you would need, uh, including a, a pretty much your house would have to end up in the neighbor's lawn before you would you would get to that. Um, and you'd also see hazard mitigation assistance, which can be available. We are working on some projects here for that. But again, uh, nothing comes for free. That's the same through the federal government. Uh, a lot of this takes a significant amount of work and hazard mitigation projects tend to take four to six years to complete. So that usually when you're looking at a cycle that's last year and this year, that is not even enough time to get yourself um, approved to apply for this grant, let alone the surveys that are needed. Uh, there's tens of thousands of dollars worth of um, usually uh, just surveys and engineering data that's needed to do a um, application at this level. So those are competitive. Those are nationwide grants. A lot of them do have to do with flooding uh, more so than erosion. And so you can see neighborhoods that would get in for things like that. Um, but you would be up against neighborhoods uh, down in the Mississippi Delta where hundreds of homes are flooded out or big, huge things like that. And so uh, you would again have to suffer 
pretty significant repeated damage in order to uh, make it, uh, you might be able to apply, but to really get funding out of it, uh, it's really reserved for um, the most damaged areas in the country. And so because this is, um, this is individually damaging uh, on, on a more or less short-term basis right now, um, it's harder to get into places that are suffering more repeated damage, um, especially on our, on our larger coastal, the rest of the coastal um, areas in the United States. It, this is very tricky to get through. So it, it is possible but it is not an easy uh, effort to go through. Um, and as an individual, you can't apply for that. It would have to be as like a neighborhood or, or a township, it would have to be um, uh, quite a bit of damage across a large area in order to be considered for some of these projects. So again, it's sort of there, but there isn't a um, magic pill uh, coming up here on my, my last slide here. Uh, to reiterate what um, the other professionals on this webinar have gone through so far is that um, private property owners need to understand the specifics of their properties, reaching out to the field crews at Eagle to be able to come out and take a look. Um, to an extent, the Army Corps of Engineers that's able to discuss with people or you know, seeking out a shoreline engineer to discuss some options are really your best bets. Um, a home mover will tell you how you can pick up your house and put it from here to there, but that's not the type of person that you should talk about you know, putting in rocks along the shoreline or other mitigative efforts there. You have to really make sure that you're getting uh, the professionals that can do the math and know what's good and not just what can be done, but what's actually going to be effective. Um, if there is a stretch of shoreline that you can band with neighbors uh, for some common and connected problems with to make a larger project, that's a good idea. Uh, just so that you don't see those issues where every other house is handled but the ones in between end up destabilizing um, a larger area or, um, or that people are doing different um, methods across an area that maybe could use a consistent one. So getting together with a, a group of neighbors along a stretch might help so that you don't get a lot of um, choppy issues in between remediated areas. Um, but seeking out the guidance that you can from state and federal agencies that handle this on a regular basis is very important. Um, and don't be afraid of the permitting process. The permitting is honestly there to help people not do further damage either to themselves or to their neighbors with good intentions. It just, they, there's a lot of science behind what works and what doesn't. And those are there to make sure that there is some sort of um, emergency break before damaging actions are taken. Otherwise, there is, uh, there's no magic pill. I, I cannot just call FEMA and have them come save your house. Uh, as much as I would love to, that is not how that works. So um, this is going to take a little while, but uh, those efforts are, are there long term. Um, but going back to what Jennifer had put up along that, that gorgeous shoreline with um, nice plants and the appropriate amount of rocks is going to be the best thing that a lot of you guys can do. So there is my contact information on the screen, and I will hang back for the question and answer setting. Thank you, Megan. Um, and so I know we are running behind on time. So for those of you that have to leave, um, I want to just quickly say um, on behalf of the Watershed Council, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you'll receive a survey next week asking for feedback on the event and um, your insights really do help us out uh, as we shape future events like this. It will also include a link to the recording of this event, um, which will be made available next week on both our, uh, the Watershed Council website, as well as our YouTube um, page. So uh, that is where that will be available. Um, for those who stick around, we will do some question and answer with the panelists and see where we can get. Um, so if panelists want to make themselves um, seen, uh, we'll go through and answer some of these questions, um, at least for a little bit. 
Um, so, and we lost Ashley due to technical difficulties. So now I'll be in the Q and A. Um, so, uh, Deanna, is sea level rise impacting Great Lakes water levels? No, so sea level rise is, is, uh, is different, um, you know, where sea level rise is really being impacted by melting glaciers. Um, you know, the Great Lakes water levels aren't, aren't, are not, um, you know, you know, impacted that. They're more impacted by the hydrological cycle, that seasonal cycle, as I, as I talked about um, in, the, in the presentation. Thank you. Um, Joe, one of the Eagle slides showed that riparians hold title to um, na natural accretions. What about the depositing of dredging spoils? Are those private property too? Yeah, I read that question. I've been trying to, to type some responses while I was sitting through Megan's um, presentation, trying to get a jump on some of these excellent questions. Um, it depends, you know, repairing ownership sketchy. If it's a Great Lakes issue, um, Great Lakes bottomlands are owned by the state of Michigan in general. So if you were like going to Harbor Springs and looking at uh, the marinas out there, they pay a fee, an annual fee to lease those bottomlands from the state. And it can be quite substantial. Um, so they're assessed um, just like any other property, state of Michigan has people that will assess that value and charge the marinas to use that property. Inland lakes are different. It's privately owned. So in typically privately owned, there's always exceptions with riparian law. So um, if somebody's getting a permit to fill, that's probably, it should be addressed with that permit review. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question um, but the, generally, if, if you are allowed to fill out from your inland riparian lot, that would be your property. Thank you. Um, uh, Deanna, is there any Lake Michigan geological data or studies that suggest even higher lake levels prior to 1918? Um. I am aware of a few studies that have been done by uh, two, uh, two, two people called, their last name is Bade Key and Thompson. Um, they've done some research on Lake Michigan here on, here on water levels that go back into the, to the Holocene uh, period. So, um, you know, I, I definitely check out uh, the, those resources. Uh, I believe they do show uh, potentially higher uh, Michigan here on water levels when you go back that far in time. Great, thank you. And one more for you. Why is lake evaporation less during warm winters? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what, what really um, ignites evaporation is really having the warm surface water. So the surface water being warm and cold air moving over that surface water is really what induces evaporation. So when you have a warmer than normal winter, like we saw in December and January, you have warmer air over the, over the region, which now your temperature difference between the air and the lake surface is much smaller. So you get decreased evaporation during that time. And that's what we saw this winter um, with that with that warmer than normal. So it's a little bit counterintuitive than maybe what most people think. It's really the warm surface water and that cold air moving over the region, which really ignites evaporation. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question that says, who prepares bioengineering landscape plans and assures their adequacy to prevent erosion? Um, that would be a landscape architect. Uh, Tip of the Mint Watershed Council has a landscape architect on staff, so you can contact our office if you're interested in um, uh, having a bioengineering plan done. We can also, if you're not in Northern Michigan, we can also um, probably recommend some um, other contractors that would do it. Um, so contact our office. Um, Joe, what is the average time for a permit to be approved? Yeah, so it depends. I think our turnaround time is pretty quick right now, depending on what you're talking about. If it's uh, 
you know, emergency permitting, if you've got a house that's fallen into Lake Michigan, we have been turning permits over pretty quickly. You know, if you talk to us before you do any work, get in the my water system with photographs and a description of what you're going to do at least a, a bare bones application we can authorize a project and issue a public notice on that the same day so i would say a couple of few days three or four days maybe five days depending on the urgency urgency of the situation but the average time for permits are probably between right now i'd say 90 days they're getting pretty long because you know on, on an average permit if, if you're coming to us with a, a small wetland fill, that's not going to be prioritized because we're dealing with high water urgent situations. And so you might get a little bit of a uh, less robust treatment, um, but I would say 90 days. That's sort of my seat of the pants assessment as a district supervisor. Thank you. Megan, do Great Lakes inhabited islands get any special treatment as far as emergency declarations go? Uh, nope, you have to meet the criteria no matter where you are. So the flooding issues that can be managed might be able to be managed one way, um, but otherwise no, the, the process is the process. There usually isn't any special exemptions outside of that. It would have to be created within the legislature. Thank you. Um, Tiana, what impact, if any, is climate change having on Great Lakes water levels? Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So um, as far as, as climate change goes, um, you know, it's a very hard, um, it's very hard to attribute climate change um, to to water level changes. Um, you know, we know in these recent years, the very wet pattern we've seen in the Great Lakes region has really uh, helped to transition that water levels from, you know, fairly low water period to a high water period, especially these very, there's these very recent few years of very wet weather we've seen. Um, but, you know, it wasn't, again, I would like to point out that, that you know, it wasn't too long ago, you know, seven years ago, uh, we're answering the same questions, but in relation to low water. Um, and, and really, the, what, there's a lot of meteorological variables that impact water levels. You know, I've mentioned precipitation, evaporation, runoff, you've got, you know, ice cover, air temperature is impacting, you know, and water temperature. And how those all are going to change over time is a very difficult task and it's very uncertain. And, and so it makes then that knowing that impact to water levels uh, even more difficult. Um, so it's very hard to, you know, to attribute uh, water level change to climate change. Um, but like I said, we do know that the current situation we are in is due to this wet pattern we've seen. Great, thank you. Um, is bioengineering a shore protection system uh, as an option on Lake Michigan Huron or just inland lakes? Um, so given the um, energy levels on Lake Michigan and Huron, uh, generally it does not work on the Great Lakes. Um, uh, even though we do have um, measures for high energy lakes, uh, we generally recommend those practices on the inland lakes. Um, and the method that uh, we're recommending as far as the preferred shoreline protection method for the Great Lakes is moving your home back if possible. Um, and then let's see, if a neighbor starts to put in a seawall or other barrier, how can one find out if it's permissible? Joe, do you want to take that or would you like me to? Can you repeat the question? If a neighbor starts to put in a seawall or other barrier, how can one find out if it's permissible? Right, so you can look it up in My Waters. You could look up the location with an address or with the environmental mapper. Um, you could call the district office where the site's located um, and inquire. It, the Water Resource Division Secretary could answer that question for you, usually. Um, you could look up, uh, there's a lot of different ways. You could look up the land and water uh, permit staff, the field staff map for that county and call them and ask them. They might 
you know, they're typically the, the individuals that would have issued a permit for that. You know, when I get these sorts of questions, people complaining or concerned about work, I go back to a sort of, I call it a cowboy way of thinking. Like if you were out and out in the wild west and you didn't have a database to look at, what would you do? You'd have to go talk to them. And you should be nice to your neighbors anyways. So go ask your neighbor, talk to them. You know, before you call the regulatory agency that's stressed out and overwhelmed with work, talk to your neighbor. If they don't have a permit and they're working, then call us. But be nice to them. Take a, take a basket of cookies over to them and ask them, hey, are you, are you to get the right permits? That'd be my suggestion. Thanks, Joe. Uh, one more for you. Does uh, the permitting process um, apply for modifying structures on lake bottom for seasonal docks and boat lifts if they're installed in the spring and removed in early fall? So they're saying there's some type of anchoring device on the bottom or something. Um, it's seasonal permanent docks, structures. We, yeah. Seasonal permanent docks structure, and boat lifts. Right. Sorry. So permanent structures need a permit. If they're leaving an anchor in there, technically it needs a permit, it's gonna be a super low priority. Um, if there's no, you know, we're looking at resource impacts, um, adjacent riparian impacts, uh, those sorts of things, um, navigation impacts. So that's gonna be a low priority in general, but um, there's a lot of technicalities that if you read the law, it's black and white, and it might say, yes, you would need a permit to put a one foot square concrete block in front of your dock, uh, but, uh, I don't know that field staff are generally going to be bringing a hammer down for enforcement on something like that, or even want to deal with a permit application on something so de minimis. Thank you. Dana, not sure if you can answer this, but we'll try. Wasn't Lake Michigan as high as it is now earlier in the 1800s, according to NOAA data? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. Um, I will say though um, that you know beginning in the 1860s, um, Lake Michigan here on water level was calculated um, using a master gauge, which I believe on Michigan here on was Harbor Beach, um, and um, you know now now we use uh, you know in, in the period of record we use the the network of water level gauges to to compute um, the the average level of the of the lake. Um, so it is definitely possible that, you know, water levels were similar, you know, back in the 1800s. Um, but yeah, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not 100%. Thank you. Um, um, so this question is, Deanna, um, can you explain why releasing water through regulated bottlenecks doesn't have a meaningful effect on lake levels. I think it's talking about regulating water levels and why they doesn't have a, a large impact on the actual water levels. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll try to answer this, uh, you know, as briefly as I can here. The, you know, the, the regulation plans, um, you know, especially the, those, the, you know, those are in place, you know, uh, at the, you know, as I mentioned, you know, out of Lake Superior through the St. Mary's River and out of Lake Ontario, um, you know, there's a lot of study that goes into those plans, um, you know, that uh, the IJC does um, to, you know, understand the impacts, you know, especially for like Lake Superior, you know, the impacts of the Lake Superior watershed and in the Lake Michigan here, here on watershed, um, you know, how it affects ecosystems, hydropower, navigation, all these things go into, you know, determining um, you know, what the plan will be and then what that outflow will be. Um, and, you know, so those, it's a regulation of outflow is what I want to make my point as it, it's not, a, we, those plans are in place to regulate lake level. They're there to help distribute the outflow, uh, you know, allocate flow to the power plants that are there. Um, and, and to, you know, to, to help, you know, it does, you know, it does take into look into account what the lake levels are on those lakes, you know, Lake Superior, Michigan, here on Ontario, it does, does look at that. It does take that into account. Obviously, you know, if, if there can be some benefit to, you know, to that flow, 
Um, but they're, you know, they don't have, with the amount of flow that can leave Lake Superior, the amount of flow that can leave Lake Ontario, um, it's not enough to, um, you know, to result in large uh, lake level changes. But I mean, really, uh, you know, like I said in, in the presentation, the primary driver of those water levels is mother nature and, and weather. And right now we've been in a persistent wet pattern and, and the, you know, the lake levels are high, outflows are high because we have a lot of water in the system right now. Great, thank you. Um, so question is, how do we best evaluate the best measures for erosion control on our Lake Michigan property? Our contractor's permit started and recommends large stone riprap, which might be extreme. Uh, the neighbors on either side have had sandbags covered with sand there since the 80s. Uh, so the recommendation I would have is um, one, if you're in the service area of the Watershed Council, you can always um, reach out to us and we'll be willing to talk to you about um, your specific property and what we would recommend based upon your site conditions. You can also reach out to Eagle and the field staff and hopefully they can provide you recommendations based upon um, the site conditions. Um, I, and I would recommend doing that in advance of submitting the permit. It's much easier to um, make changes and modifications prior to a permit being submitted um, rather than doing it after the fact. Joe or anything to add to that? No, I think that sounds good. Okay, great. I got to run. I got to get on a call at one o'clock. Okay, yep, and I was just gonna say at this point, um, you know, we're, we went a half an hour over, which I thank um, all of our panelists for doing. Um, so I think we're, we're gonna close it out and I apologize to everyone if we did not get to your question. Um, uh, but again, um, we, we went over it as it was. Um, as I close out, I would like to, um, uh, leave you with some resources um, that might be useful for you. Um, in addition, I'll mention that the Watershed Council is developing fact sheets and we'll be updating our website um, shortly, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, again, I'd like to give a special thanks to all of our presenters, as well as the Charlevoix County Community Foundation and the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation for making uh, today's webinar possible. As I previously mentioned, next week you'll be receiving a survey via email. Again, your insights and feedback are extremely helpful uh, to help us improve these type of events for next time. Um, and again, on behalf of the Watershed Council, thank you for joining us today. I uh, hope you found this information very valuable. And the, um, you can always reach out to myself or anyone at the Watershed Council um, for more information or to get more, some of your other questions answered. And with that, I wish you all to have a great day and please stay health, healthy and stay safe.